Friends, in our last lecture about the disciples of Christ in the Qur'an, we began to discuss the question of the Qur'an's relationship with the Bible. In this lecture, we're going to address that topic specifically. We're going to look at how the Qur'an integrates, discusses, and develops themes and traditions of biblical literature. Now, in this whole section of the course, we've been looking at how the Qur'an discusses characters we know from the Bible, Adam, Noah, Moses, and in the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles or the disciples. But we so far have not asked the question of what the Qur'an thinks of the Bible. According to the Qur'an, is the Bible a valid, authoritative scripture or something less than that? Or another question that arises here is, what does the author of the Qur'an know of the Bible? We've mentioned that the author of the Qur'an doesn't refer to specific biblical books. And so we have something like an enigma before us. On the one hand, the Qur'an refers commonly to biblical characters, shows a great interest in biblical stories. But on the other hand, the Qur'an provides very little specific information about the Bible. Indeed, the Qur'an never refers to any biblical book, from Genesis to Revelation, not one. It doesn't speak of four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It only uses the word gospel in the singular. So how should we resolve this enigma? What does the Qur'an actually know about the Bible? And what is the Qur'an's perspective on the Bible? Well, we might begin by looking at the way the Qur'an does refer to earlier revelations or earlier scriptures. The Qur'an speaks to revelations given to earlier prophets. It speaks of a book, the Taurat, given to Moses. It speaks of a book, Zabur, given to David. And it speaks of a book, Injil, given to Jesus. Now, all three of these Arabic names have roots in biblical tradition in non-Arabic languages. The word Taurat, which is the revelation or scripture given to Moses, comes, of course, ultimately from the Hebrew word Torah, which is used to refer to the first five books of the Bible. The word Zabur, for the revelation given to David, is ultimately related to the words used by Christians writing in Ethiopic and Syriac for the Psalms. And of course, we remember that according to Jewish and Christian tradition, David was the author of the Psalms. And the word Injil, used for the revelation given to Jesus, comes ultimately for the Greek word meaning gospel, euangelion, probably passed through another language, Syriac, along the way. On the other hand, it seems that the Quran does not seem to know the Bible well. We've already mentioned that the Quran doesn't refer to any specific biblical book, but we might also mention that the Qur'an does not differentiate between stories from the Bible itself and stories from later apocryphal books or other legendary books. For example, the, story, the stories that we find in Qur'an or Surah 18 that are connected on the one hand to the sleepers of Ephesus legend or the legend surrounding Alexander the Great, who in the Qur'an becomes a character known as Dhul Qarnain. In addition, in a couple of places, the Qur'an seems to make specific uh, rather claims about the Bible, which seem to be not completely backed up by what we find in the Bible itself. In one passage, Qur'an chapter 7, verse 157, we see a claim made by the Qur'an that Muhammad, at least he's alluded to here, is found in the Bible. We read in this verse, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, Maybe unlettered isn't the best translation. It could be the Gentile prophet, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and the gospel in their possession. Now, this verse has led to a long history of Muslims speculating either that Muhammad was originally referred to in these biblical books, but those passages were erased or suppressed, or that read properly, there are still prophecies of Muhammad in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. Sometimes the passages promising the coming of the Holy Spirit or the Comforter, or the Paraclete, in the Gospel of John are seen by Muslims as anticipations or references to the coming, not of the Holy Spirit, but of Muhammad. But there's another passage which also suggests that the Qur'an doesn't seem to know the contents of the Bible very well. In Qur'an chapter 9, verse 111, we read, God has purchased from the believers their lives and their properties in exchange for paradise. They fight in God's way, and they kill and get killed. It is a promise binding on him in the Torah and the Gospel and the Quran. Now this verse seems to be in some dissidence with what we actually find. In the Old Testament, there's no explicit mention of paradise, but this Quranic verse says those who fight 
in God's way will go to paradise. And of course, in the New Testament, there's no mention that fighting to paradise, fighting rather in God's way, will be a way of getting to paradise. Thus, we have the impression that the Quran knew of the Bible and biblical material not through the text of the Bible itself, but rather through oral tradition, through the ways in which Jews and Christians in the late antique Middle East or Near East related orally biblical traditions or biblical stories. Indeed, we've mentioned before the Quran only seems to quote once from the Bible. This is Quran chapter 21, verse 105, where we have a reference to the Psalms. The Quran says, We have written in the Psalms after the reminder that the earth will be inherited by my righteous servants. This seems to be connected to Psalm 3729. Otherwise, the Quran only comes close in one place to quoting from the New Testament when it refers to the camel passing through the eye of the needle. But when the Quran does this in chapter 7, verse 40, it says, Those who reject our revelations and are too arrogant to uphold them, the doors of heaven will not be opened for them, nor will they enter paradise until the camel pass through the eye of the needle. It doesn't refer to the maxim about a rich man entering paradise being more difficult than a camel passing through the eye of the needle, as we find in the Gospels in Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. So we have something of a dissonance, as we've mentioned, between Quran and Bible. And this left a problem for Muslim scholars to resolve. Why is it that what the Quran says about the Bible, or says about the revelations given to Moses, David, and Jesus, doesn't seem to match up with the Bible and the possession of the Jews and the Christians? And Muslims came up with a solution to this riddle. And the solution was a theory that Jews and Christians corrupted or falsified the original pure revelations given to earlier prophets. This solution was, in a sense, forced upon Muslim scholars because on the one hand, the sorts of terms used for revelation, Torah, Gospel, don't seem to match up with the Old Testament and New Testament. But on the other hand, the actual message of the Quran does not seem to match the message of the Bible. So Muslims developed the idea of this corruption or falsification. The Arabic term for this corruption or falsification is tahrif. Very often, we'll find that Muslims will tell stories to try to explain how the original revelations given to the prophets could have been corrupted or falsified into what we know now of the Bible. One Muslim scholar known as Abdul Jabbar, who dies in 1025, tells the story of the Jews and Christians soon after the life of Christ being together, but eventually the Christians, looking to have some independence or authority, went to the Roman soldiers who ruled over them both and made a deal with the Roman soldiers. When they did so, however, they lost possession of the original book given to Jesus, this Injil, and so they had to come up with a new book, and they began to rewrite passages and invent passages, and this is how the Gospels were originally written. We might note that even today, a common Muslim view is that whereas the Quran was perfectly preserved, the Bible has been falsified and changed. And this view is almost a necessary view because the Quran itself speaks about a revelation given to Jesus. There are other traditions, however, according to which the, the Bible actually is faithfully preserved. However, the problem is the interpretation of the Bible that Jews and Christians misinterpreted. So this is another approach to this topic of tahrif, or falsification, or corruption. For example, we have one story according to which Muhammad was presented with a question over whether what is the punishment for a woman caught in adultery. And there's a Jewish rabbi in this story who claims that the woman should not be stoned, that that's not in the Torah. But also in this story is another character named Abdullah ibn Salam, a recent convert from Judaism to Islam, who knows according to the logic of the story, that the true punishment is stoning. Indeed, it's said, according to the story, that the rabbi physically covered up the place in the Torah where it says that a woman caught in adultery should be stoned. And Ibn Salam struck his hand to remove it from that place and then declared, This, O Messenger of God, is the verse of stoning which he refuses to read to you. Muhammad is appalled and cries out, Woe to you Jews! What has induced you to abandon the judgment of God which you hold in your hands? Such stories have been written in part to explain references in the Quran. For example, the detail of Ibn Salam striking the rabbi's hand, physically uncovering the place in the Torah where you have the punishment for a woman caught in adultery, 
seems to be a way of explaining Quran, for example, chapter 3, verse 187. God received a pledge from those who were giving the scripture. You shall proclaim it to the people and not conceal it. Other passages in the Quran, such as 371 and 242, also speak about not concealing or clothing God's scripture. And those passages come to life in these stories which are told about a Jew literally covering, covering up a passage of the revelation or the scripture which had been originally given to Moses. But the logic of these passages is that scripture originally given to Moses is still good, is still valid, but it's the interpretation which is invalid. Indeed, that seems to be the principal argument of the Quran. The Quran never speaks about the Bible itself being a corrupt or falsified book. What the Quran speaks about is that the revelations given to Moses and Jesus have been ignored, misread, forgotten, or hidden. We see this in passages such as Quran chapter 2, verse 59. But the wrongdoers among them substituted words other than those given to them. Or chapter 2, verse 79. So woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands. And then say, this is from God that they may exchange it for a little price. Other passages such as Quran chapter 4 verse 46 speak of, here it seems to be the Israelites, twisting their tongues and slandering the religion. This twisting of tongues again seems to be a reference not to rewriting the book or falsifying the book, but rather to misinterpreting the book. Indeed, that interpretation seems to be the Quran's main concern seems to be confirmed by other passages which suggest indeed that the books of the Jews and Christians are still valid. Quran chapter 4 verse 136 commands the believers to believe not only in the book of God, but in the books of God, those sent down before. Quran chapter 5 verse 47 speaks of the people of the gospel, Ahlul Injil. It's the only time this phrase appears in the, in the Quran, incidentally. And it declares, so let the people of the gospel rule according to what God has revealed in it. Now the logic of this verse suggests that the gospel, the valid gospel, must still be available. Why else would the Quran be commanding Christians to be, if that's indeed the, the referent or the sense of people of the gospel, why else would the Quran be commanding Christians to rule according to the gospel? They must have it with them. Still more interesting is Quran chapter 10 verse 94 where the Qur'an seems to order Muhammad himself to go to Jews and Christians to ask them about his revelations if he has any doubt. If you are in doubt about what we revealed to you, ask those who read the scripture before you. Thus, while Islamic tradition teaches that the Bible is invalid, is falsified or corrupted, the Qur'an itself seems to teach that the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are valid the problem is in the interpretations of the Jews and Christians about those scriptures.